Valle de los Caídos, in Spain, the Valley of the Fallen. Nearly half a century after the Civil War, the men who created and won that war have preserved its massive monument. General Franco called the uprising against the Republican government a crusade, a fight for Christian civilization. Others called it fascism. It was for nearly three years the world's moral arena. Inside this mausoleum today, there is no hint of reconciliation. This huge tomb for Franco's men was hewn in a granite mountain by his defeated enemies, Republican prisoners of war. Before this altar of Christian piety and Francoist victory lies the man who led Spain's fascist party, Jose Antonio. The great dome celebrates the victorious nationalists almost as a celestial host. And below it, behind the altar, the Generalissimo himself, Franco, now deeply part of the Spanish language, in homage or hate. As a soldier, Franco has served the Republic, but his heart was monarchist. He was called a fascist and died a dictator. The contradictions of Franco are part of the heart of Spain itself. It was said, in time to come, that Franco was a cautious and even reluctant conspirator in the army's coup d'etat, which began the Civil War. But he became Europe's longest ruling dictator of our century, the archetype of dominant endurance. When Franco was born in 1892, Spain was still a proud imperial power. Franco was a child with that empire dissolved. The American wars lost Cuba and the Philippines. It was a grievous blow to Spanish pride and also a knock for the young Franco. He had wanted to follow his father and brother into the Spanish Navy, but with the dissolution of an overseas Spain, that was cut back. So for Francisco Franco, it had to be the unglamorous and rather disgruntled army. For Franco, and so many of his class and generation, the army was his education. He confirmed the political images of the past, which were romantic, or ambitious, or probably both. Spain had lost its empire, but it still clung desperately and bitterly to its last vestige of glory abroad. In its protectorate of Morocco, Spain sought to erase its humiliations far away by redoubling its military dominance. At home, as so often in military restlessness, party politics meant very little. The officers were either indifferent or vaguely hostile. The only consideration, almost religious, was patria, the fatherland. As a career army officer, Francisco Franco flew very high and very fast. He became in succession the youngest captain major and colonel. By the age of 33, he was a general. He had commanded the Spanish Foreign Legion for four years, following his personal mentor, the much wounded and scarred hero, General Mian Estray. Mian Estray was the founder of this disciplined and brutal elite of the Spanish army. The Foreign Legion, 
was used to suppress the Asturias Rebellion against the Republican government in 1934. This was the regiment's first military use at home. It was an experience no one forgot, and Franco advised on the conduct of the operation. Later, he was appointed chief of staff and served under the Republic. As such, he represented Spain at the funeral of the English King George V at Windsor in January 1936. Franco himself was personally and politically a monarchist. He supported the restoration of the Spanish king, who had fallen from power four years earlier. Few people know that Francisco Franco once nudged his way into the movie business. After the war, he wrote a feature film under a pseudonym, which reveals his contempt for democratic politics. The script follows the lives of three brothers. It's a situation not unlike Franco's own family. His younger brother, Ramon, was a Republican. And in this scene, one brother, who wants to be a Republican politician, is arguing with another, an army officer, about using his inheritance for a political career. Their mother has agreed to share out the estate. It was perhaps easier for Franco to understand than for us. The film's breathless commentary goes on to describe the five years of Spain's fragile democracy, in Franco's version of events at least. Como si el reto de los dos hermanos tuviese un signo profético y fatal, así iba a dividirse la familia española. El Frente Popular que el Comité Comunista patrocinó va a destruir las puras esencias de la tradición española. La hora de la revolución comunista había sonado. España no podía perecer. Destruction of traditional values. Communist revolution. These were the catchwords with which the insurgent generals rallied most of Spain's middle class against the Republic. Petra Roman de Bondia was a young girl from a conservative family in Salamanca. I thought that the military uprising would bring an improvement in every sense. Our ideals and what we thought Franco and his army were going to defend were God, the homeland, the family and order. We thought that the rising would change everything. We never imagined that it would be such a long war. Before the war, in the five years of democracy between 1931 and 36, the Spanish Republic had not just been a new order. It had questioned all the assumptions of accepted society, and now some people wanted to put the clock back. Tomás Garicano Goñi was a young army officer. I think that most of our hopes were fundamentally negative. That is to say, we wanted to stop certain things. Public disorder, the labor upheavals, which did so much harm to both management and workforce. We wanted to do away with religious persecution. Not only was religious education banned, but also any teaching by the religious orders. We wanted really to return to a more traditional Spanish way of life, a peaceful one, which this Republican government had failed to bring. The social upheavals of the Republic had led to a progressive breakdown of law and order. In the countryside, peasants hungry to own the land they worked seized it. Some landowners had been killed, and others feared for their lives. Peace was impossible, so we had to head for the hills. If it's just not possible to live, then you have to find a different solution, which was the rising against the Republic. Franco had begun with curious discretion. He had joined the army coup in Morocco with expressly limited aims of restoring order and crushing the revolution. 
but his proclamation did not invoke the church or any crusade. He did, to be sure, hint darkly about foreign influences assailing traditional values. What was surprising to some was that his proclamation concluded with the unexpectedly democratic slogans fraternity, liberty, equality. But that, he said, was the absolute order of their priority. The first army decrees gave instant comfort to its middle-class supporters. That was fairly easy. All the land the Republican reforms had shared out was to go back to the owners. Trade unions were banned. So were all political parties of the Popular Front. But first, the army had to face the fact that its initial coup had failed. Armed working-class resistance had defeated the army rising in five key cities. Spain was divided. The Republican government held Madrid, the Basque Country, and nearly half the rest of Spain. And the Nationalist command was split. General Muller in the north, and in the south, Franco with his Army of Africa. The Nationalists' original plan had been to install General San Jorge as commander-in-chief. But he died in a plane crash as he left Portugal to take command in Spain. It left a difficult gap. Two months later, the rebel generals gathered for a meeting in Salamanca. A strong lobby for Franco was gaining ground. All but one voted in favour of a single commander-in-chief. The sole objection was from Miguel Cabaneas, who had been temporarily appointed leader of the military junta. Next, Franco was proposed. Again, all but Cabaneas agreed. The decision was delayed. What was desperately needed was a man whom all under arms on the insurgent side would support. Already the insurgents were split with differences. There was the old Peninsular Army. There was a civil guard, the Army of Africa, Spanish units and Moors, let alone the armed militias of the fascist Falanque and columns of monarchists and traditionalists. All these armed factions had conflicting expectations of their leader. Alone among the rivals, Franco seemed to satisfy the factions. He was the man in the middle. His reputation to as a soldier ensured him popular support, and this was immediately reinforced by events. Driving on to the relief of Toledo, the advance of General Franco's columns from the west is pushed on remorselessly. White troops and Moors, well armed and trained in modern methods of warfare, supported by powerful artillery, overcome the resistance of government militia whose retreat is on Madrid rather than Toledo. General Franco arrives to embrace and honor Colonel Moscado, the brave and bearded commander. The victory at Toledo inflated Franco's prestige. Even before his appointment as commander-in-chief was announced, his supporters were planning higher office for him. They proposed he should be not only supreme military commander, but head of the government. Some of his colleagues were doubtful. Nevertheless, Francisco Franco emerged as the undisputed leader and called himself head of state. On October 1st, 1936, Franco was granted all powers of the new state of Spain, at least for the duration of the war. My personal reaction to Franco's appointment was one of relief. Nationalist soldiers were saying, a single command wins a war. A split command loses a war. Franco's appointment was unquestioned. There wasn't anyone else who could hold a candle to him, and it was a source of great relief all round. The army generals who appointed Franco as head of government, as a military necessity, may not have realized that they were establishing a personal dictatorship. Many different groups had supported their rising. First, the Conservatives, who had supported the right-wing parliamentary coalition Theda before the war. Second, the Monarchists, who sought the restoration of King Alfonso. Third, the Carlists, mainly from Navarre. They were also called Traditionalists. They were religious, supported a king too, albeit a different claimant, and fought for their regional rights. Fourth, the Falanque, the fascist party outlawed by the Republic. They claimed to transcend the right and left of politics, but called 
for a radical social revolution. General Moller, for one, was fully aware of the wild complexity of the various factions. He had successfully negotiated the support of both the Carlists and the Falanque for the plot. Soon after Franco's appointment, Moller spoke to Pedro Sainz Rodriguez, the right-wing monarchist intellectual who had joined the uprising and later joined Franco's government. I remember very well that there was a large armchair in front of the desk and General Moller was sitting on the arm of it with his feet on the seat and he asked me, what do you think will happen when the war ends? I said there will be a problem with all the different political interests. He said, I'm pleased to hear you say that. When the war is over, it will be necessary to have some sort of constitution and parliament. In Franco's plan, there was no question of a parliament. The army decree gave all powers of the new state to him. He referred to himself as head of state twice in his first proclamation. For many people, his own political ideology was a mystery. Did he have a political theory? Many people thought that he was a man who was keeping a secret, but I called him the Sphinx without a secret. He had the air of a Sphinx, but there was no secret. He was silent on many subjects because he had no opinion on them. Franco had never claimed to be a politician, but he was of the intuitive right, an instinctive defender of capitalism. With his brother Nicholas as secretary, he prepared his program. No working class trade unions. Help for peasants, but land for landowners. Concord with the church. Above all, no democracy. That way, perhaps, the working class opposition could be wiped out forever. Un estado totalitario armonizará en España el funcionamiento de todas las capacidades y energías del país en el que dentro de la unidad nacional el trabajo estimado como el más ineludible de los deberes, será el único exponente de la voluntad popular. Y merced, y merced a él, podrá manifestarse el auténtico sentir del pueblo español a través de aquellos órganos naturales que como la familia, el municipio, la asociación y la corporación harán cristalizar en realidades nuestro ideal supremo. These aims of the Spanish right could only be secured by repression. Even before Franco took command, working-class resistance was physically extinguished by advancing nationalist columns. Franco himself continued the purge. Franco estaba un día que fui yo a hablar con él, que me llamó para una interview que le habían hecho. One day when I went to see Franco, he called me for an interview before I was a minister. He was sitting at a table drinking chocolate, dunking bits of bread and biscuits into it, and he had a heap of files on the left and was classifying them. Some he put on the table, others on a chair. Afterwards, on leaving, I asked an adjutant what were those files which General Franco had. They were the death sentences. Those which he placed on the chair were for signing and the others for revision. It was something done quite calmly. For him, it was simply a military matter. There were few critics of these methods in the nationalist zone. Franco's supporters were united in the common cause of defeating the Republic. But as to what to replace it with, there was much dispute. First, there were the fascists, the Falanque. Before the war and his imprisonment, their leader, Jose Antonio, had tried to present a doctrine of seductive simplicity. Tenemos una fe resuelta, es que están vivas todas las fuentes genuinas de España. España ha venido a menos por una triple división, por la división engendrada por los separatismos locales, por la división engendrada entre los partidos y por la división engendrada por la lucha de clases. Cuando España encuentre una empresa colectiva que supere todas esas diferencias, España volverá a ser grande como en sus mejores tiempos. Falanque's fascism was disguised by revolutionary jargon. 
Artiso Parales was one of its first members. La Falange era un movimiento revolucionario que pretendía cambiar The Falange was a revolutionary movement which wanted to carry out profound changes in the Spanish society of those times. Changes which are still necessary today. José Antonio proclaimed a doctrine which resolved opposing doctrines in society. It upheld spiritual values and the belief in the fatherland as our common and universal destiny, and at the same time it aimed for a social revolution. The agrarian reform would turn the land over to the peasants so that the vision of giving the ownership of the land to those who work it would come true. Banks would be nationalized because it was considered unjust that the savings of all the Spanish people should be controlled by a few who dominated the economy of the country. The Falanque's leadership was predominantly middle class or aristocratic young men, but the movement was designed to appeal to working class sentiments, albeit staunchly anti-Marxist. Raimundo Fernández Cuesta later became Secretary General of the Falange. We discussed whether we should wear any distinctive clothing. José Antonio said, we should wear a blue shirt. It's the same color as the proletariat's overalls. And it was the same for the flag. It was black and red because that was the flag of the anarchist trade unions. We wanted ours to be similar. The same with the word comrade, traditionally used by the communists. José Antonio said, I don't see why we shouldn't claim it ourselves. Give the word comrade a different meaning. In spite of its pretensions, the Falange never became a mass fascist party with large working class membership. Unlike what had happened in Germany and Italy, fascism had not taken root in Spain before the war. For one thing, the economic conditions were very different. Spain was still economically in the 19th century. The groups that might have been attracted by fascism were either satisfied by conventional politics or just non-existent. There was no large petty bourgeoisie scarred by recession or defeat in a world war. The middle class was reassured that the dominant presence of the army would protect them from revolution and the working class had suffered no disappointment that might provoke them to find an alternative to Marxist, socialist or anarchist ideals. In 1936, however, after the February elections when democracy disintegrated into political violence, conservative youth had begun to defect to the radical alternative, and once the war began, people flocked to the Falange. It was a demonstration of allegiance to the nationalist cause, and moreover, with a purge of working-class organizations, it became a safe haven for anybody whose background was suspiciously leftist. The blue shirt became known as a Salva Vida, a life jacket. Some nationalists, however, viewed the Falange's populist and violent image with distaste. There were many people who joined the Falangists, but I could never join them because I did not consider them to be virtuous in the Christian sense of the term. I did not think that the Falangists were Christians. I did not think that they acted in a way that I considered to be correct, and I never liked them. There was a phobia against phalangism in my family, partly because the theater and the phalange were totally opposed to each other, and we all belonged to the theater. The greatest contrast to the phalange was another faction of nationalists, the Carlists, the deeply traditionalist group based in Navarre. They lived in the romantic, almost medieval past. We were defending God, the fatherland, and our king. This was the traditional slogan of Carlism. By God, we meant religion in its true sense, with no interference by the church in the government of the state. As for politics, we were in favor of regional rights, that is, we saw Spain as a conglomeration of regions which have, from time to time, been united by a common cause of Spanish nationality. Franco was no fool. He recognized the potential danger of disunity in the nationalist camp. To his brother-in-law, Ramon Serrano Sr., he gave the job of devising a formula for uniting the factions. 
los objetivos eran evitar las discordias y las The objectives were to avoid internal conflicts and rivalry, which were bound to debilitate the nascent state. This was Franco's view, and as commander-in-chief and leader in the war, I think he was right. He sought to establish and maintain a certain order and discipline in the rear guard. If the rear guard was left to the whims of the different groups, things could get out of hand and could affect the situation in the fighting fronts, as happened in the Republican zone. The Falanque was in trouble. Jose Antonio had been killed in a Republican jail. All other potential candidates were in prison or dead, and the organization was riven with ideological and personal schism. On April 17, 1937, a former mechanic, Manuel Edea, was confirmed as leader. He had no formal education, was unimaginative and ineffective. He was easy meat for Franco. Two days after his election, Franco, as head of state, declared the Falanque and the Carlis would be unified in one national movement under his own direction. When Edea challenged Franco's authority, he was sentenced to death although this sentence was commuted to life imprisonment. By bringing the Red Berit Carlist and the Blue Shirty Falanque movement under his direct leadership, Franco assured the triumph of his personal brand of authoritarian conservatism and the unity of his supporters. The man who claimed to support the restoration of the monarchy had made himself a dictator. True supporters of the king, like Eugenio Vegas Latapie, were outraged. It seemed as if the new state created by Franco wasn't so much a state as a dictatorship, a dictatorship run exclusively by him. Don Pedro Sainz Rodriguez says with some accuracy that the difference between laws and decrees in Franco's regime was that Franco pulled decrees out of one pocket and laws from the other. Everything was the exclusive wish of the Generalissimo. Franco's regime was a conservative dictatorship, but it was cloaked in symbols and ritual of fascism. In the European economic depression of the 30s, fascism could be seen, and was seen, by many as an up-to-date alternative to the politics of class struggle. To unite a nation, even forcibly, in one supposed common interest, was a superficially attractive doctrine. At least it provided Franco, the reactionary soldier, with a facade of modern political ideology. Franco saw his task as blending the conflicting elements of the new Spain while maintaining the traditional values of the old. The charismatic fascist leader Jose Antonio Primo de Rivera was gone, shot in a Republican jail. Franco assumed his mantle. One could say Franco misrepresented José Antonio. He emphasized the inoffensive side, at least what was inoffensive to conservative people, and he silenced and buried anything that threatened them. José Antonio had argued for the revolutionary upheaval of Spain's old order, but now he was dead, his name was carved in the stomach of Burgos Cathedral. Every church in Spain carried this potent legend. Thus, the Falanque revolution became absorbed within the symbolism of Spain's deepest reaction, the church. And Franco presided. Jose Antonio's memory was preserved but the radical aspirations of his brand of fascism were laid to rest.
que cumplió las predicciones de José Antonio escritas antes de la guerra. What José Antonio had predicted before the war came true. He had said that the Falange could contribute, without knowing it, to the restoration of a conservative bourgeois mediocrity of which, he commented, there is such a generous sample in Spain, and it would be adorned to add to the mockery with the choreographic figures of the blue shirts. se puso una careta de situación francamente fascista como se decía entonces The regime presented a mask which was basically fascist but deep down this wasn't the case I would describe it as a economically conservative authoritarian government because order had to be imposed but with a facade and certain details from totalitarian regimes to be found elsewhere in Europe Franco drew on support from all aspects of the old Spain, but especially and naturally he found an enthusiastic champion in the church. The Republic had attacked it, both ideologically and physically. There was never any doubt as to where the church would stand now. It protested at Republican atrocities, but on the whole turned a blind eye to the same on the nationalist side. El Mirad este hombre que llora en silencio. Y le increpan diciendo, pues tan fácil corazón tiene el hombre, atémosle al cuello a este Cristo y váyase a llorar en el fondo del río con él. Señor, la muerte se derramará sobre todas las cosas. Me acercaré al altar de Dios, al Dios que es alegría de mi juventud. Han arrancado a golpes la puerta del Sagrario, que estaba abierta. Y la mano que conoce más sangre, registra la custodia. ¿Por qué os apresuráis, almas, en el despojo? Two months after the start of the war, the Bishop of Salamanca declared that the military rebellion was a crusade. It didn't seem to matter that it was being fought by Moorish Muslim troops, whose religious symbol was not the cross, but the sword. The Church's endorsement, however, was reinforced by a letter from Spanish bishops to Catholics all over the world. In their words, the war was between the spiritual crusade in defense of law and order and the materialism of Russian Soviets. This letter was published two weeks after the rebels conquered the Basque country. Priests there, like other conservatives, served with the Basque Republican army. For them, the defense of the Catholic faith was far from the same thing as Franco's crusade. They had seen the wartime republic as a cause of freedom for Basque regionalism. They had appealed to the Pope. But although the Vatican wavered, the Pope eventually recognized the Franco regime in the summer of 1937. He later sent a nuncio to represent him in Burgos. Undoubtedly, many Spaniards believed that Franco's campaign was a holy task, and Rome's approval was a great reinforcement to the devout. A very moving experience for me was my meeting with my younger brother, who was later killed on the northern front. He'd asked for leave to come and see me. He asked for leave to me. He said to me, look, Christina, I wanted to see you because I wanted to ask you something. Those of us who die in the war, if we fight to defend God and Spain, as I'm doing, are we going to go to heaven as martyrs, even if the church doesn't give us an official place in the register? I said I was sure they would if they fought with that spirit in the name of God and the motherland. Then God would give them a place among the martyrs in heaven. The Spanish Church's endorsement, even sanctification of Franco's rebellion, was well rewarded. Religious education in state schools was again authorized. Church property was exempt from taxes. Civil marriage and divorce outlawed. Now Spain could properly be called National Catholic.
propaganda films carried the message to the faithful. This was how the rebel regime wanted or needed to be seen. Mientras los soldados del Generalísimo abren las tierras de España al Mare Nostrum, este otro soldado, humilde y laborioso, labra los campos y da a su patria el pan nuestro de cada día. Fecundado con la sangre de tantos héroes, el suelo de España se cuaja de doradas espigas, de rubias mieses, símbolos de una patria con pan y justicia como el caudillo quiere. Apart from the foreign legion and the Moors, the backbone of Franco's army were the Catholic peasants of Spain's agricultural heartland. In spite of their poverty-stricken standard of living, they chose to defend traditional values, the village and the church. They were frightened too by stories of forced collectivization in the Republican zone. With Franco, on the other hand, the price of their main crop, wheat, was guaranteed against ruinous fluctuation. Their income, however meager, was secure. In Castro Jerif, in Old Castile, the peasants had no doubt about supporting the right wing during the war, as they had done before it. During the Republic, we supported the right. We had to support them because they were under attack. During the Republic, we were persecuted, but after we were free, we could go home any time. Before, we couldn't even go out. Florentino and Agapito were typical of a simple peasantry, reassured by the nationalist regime's maintenance of traditional values embodied in the church. Their faith was their dignity. <laughs> I believe that with the church there was respect. We respected each other more. Without religion there could be no respect. That's what I think. Without the church, the priest, they just bury you like a dog. Other people are against religion, but I've always been for it. We joined Falange, and my brother was going to go to the front. But because he was my older brother, and he did more work than I did, my father said I should go in his place. In the end, he went off too. The nationalist propaganda films idealized the traditional image of Spain as distinct from the modern anomalies of the Republic. También trabajan las mujeres curtidas al sol. No importan los callos ni las heridas. Son flores sangrantes del triunfo. España entera es milicia y la milicia es austeridad, trabajo, resistencia y silencio. The contrast between the position of women in the nationalist part of Spain and that in the republican zone was extraordinary. The Republicans had emancipated women. Divorce was legalized. Discriminatory laws abolished. Now with the Civil War, some women even went to the front to fight. But in the nationalist zone, the senoras and senoritas of old Spain were revered in a subsidiary role. Pilar Primo de Rivera was the sister of Jose Antonio. She had been trapped in Republican Madrid at the start of the war. They had no sense of family duty, and the divorce law had already divided us even more, because, of course, our Catholic way of life meant we could not accept it. In the nationalist zone, everything was much more constructive, more efficient, orderly and effective. There was a reason for everything. On the other side, there was chaos and a jumble of weird ideas. That is the truth. When Pilar escaped to the nationalist zone, she set up a special women's section of the Falanque, the fascist party. Our women didn't go to the trenches. They were auxiliaries at the front, in the infirmaries, in the washroom, in the hospitals. But our view was always that the woman's most important mission and her real place was in the family, at home. So we 
So we defended the integrity of the family, the devotion of the woman to the family, particularly when the children are small and can't look after themselves. Later, the woman could apply herself to her vocational work, her studies or whatever, but without taking that too far. We have always wanted to maintain a balance and give due priority to the defense of the family. Camaradas, hoy vais a escuchar la voz de vuestro jefe. La misma voz que ha ordenado más de 100 batallas victoriosas viene ahora a hablaros a vosotras. La que escuchan atónitas las naciones viene a deciros hoy cuál es vuestra misión de mujeres dentro del movimiento. Por lo tanto, Abrid vuestros sentidos para que no perdáis ni una sola de sus palabras, ni uno solo de sus gestos. Arriba, España. Of course, it will be a man who was entrusted to direct the mission of women within the national movement. En la ciudad de Santander se celebran cursos de cultura física organizados por la sección femenina de falange española tradicionalista y de las Jones. Junto al mar Cantábrico y en donde Castilla se asoma al mar, La escuela de danza practica diario sus ejercicios. La nueva España cultiva su cuerpo y su espíritu y se prepara para crear una patria mejor. The nationalist propaganda emphasized the wholesome domestic aspects of the regime. Franco's daughter promoted this in a newsreel made for German children, with a little help from her father. ¿Quieres decirle algo a los niños alemanes? ¿Pero qué les digo? Lo que quieras. Pido a Dios que todos los niños del mundo no conozcan los sufrimientos y las tristezas que tienen los niños que están aún en poder de los enemigos de mi patria. Yo deseo que todos los niños españoles tengan una casa alegre con cariño y con juguetes. Como... Y por eso envío un beso a todos los niños del mundo. As the rebels' army secured more territory, the propaganda camera showed the charitable work of the nationalists in the captured republican towns. A women's organization, Auxilio Social, modeled on its Nazi counterpart, Winter Help, doled out bread. From the start of the war, the rebels held most of the food-producing regions of Spain. This gave them a powerful weapon both in preserving morale in their own zone and taunting the increasingly hungry Republicans. The enforced unity and morale of the nationalists seemed in stark contrast to the dejected squabbling that had beset the Republic even before the war. Everything on the radio boasted of victory. We were always winning, we were triumphant, we were strong. That's what we all felt at that time. So we were the victors, we were winning, we were the ones with God on our side. All the soldiers carried a small piece of material with the image of Jesus' heart. It was thought that God was helping us because that was how it should be. It had to be. In Licht der aufgehenden Sonne, nationale Traditionen, Zeichnen sich immer klarer die Umrisse eines neuen Spanien. Einig, groß und frei. Nazi Germany and Italy had formally recognized the rebel regime during the siege of Madrid. From the first days they had been supplying more and more military aid. When the German ambassador, General von Falpul, took the salute at the recognition ceremony, Franco described his allies as the bulwarks of culture, civilization, and Christianity in Europe. This moment, he said, marks the peak of life in this world. Franco did not, however, follow his Axis allies too far down the path of fascism. 
Nor did he, much to their annoyance, follow them into the Second World War. But he willingly, if not gratefully, accepted their practical aid, simply because without it, he could not have carried on the war. When it was finally over, Spain had to repay Germany 116 million pounds, nearly two billion pounds in today's money. But the Germans were not altruistic. They needed a steady flow of minerals for their own Nazi war machine. They suggested taking over Spanish mines. For a long time, Franco resisted. But later, when he desperately needed supplies for a final offensive, he agreed to a German majority shareholding of five mining companies. The fact of this odd triangular relationship was that Franco's Spain was much closer in temperament to Italy. The Italians encouraged Franco to be more fascist, thereby to remove the well-founded suspicion that his was merely a conservative reactionary regime. They were only marginally successful. Spain adopted fascist-style institutions, but only one piece of legislation of Franco's new state reflected the revolutionary fascist influence of Italy, a labor charter setting up corporate trade unions. When Franco set up his first cabinet in the winter of 1937, it faithfully reflected the traditional forces of conservative Spain. It had four men from the new unified political movement, but only one of them had any connection with the pre-war revolutionary Falanque. There were two personal friends of Franco. There were four military men and two monarchists, including Pedro Sáenz Rodríguez. He was supported by the army, but he took great care that the military men who entered the government would not take it over. What he presented was not exactly a military dictatorship, but a government of the Falahi and of the traditionalists. Nevertheless, the Falahi was just a sort of loincloth of his personal dictatorship. The genuine phalangists and traditionalists were prepared to do anything for the sake of their cause, so Franco could trust neither. Thus, the true party people were replaced with pseudo-phalangists and pseudo-traditionalists. And even they were gradually pushed aside, as Franco increasingly relied on the right-wing groups which, although they were not proper parties, supported him until the end of his life. We had absolute confidence in him. The Falanque wanted to run things and he sent them back. He wanted his brother-in-law to sort out the Falanque, and he got rid of him too. He couldn't have cared less. His attitude was, I'm following the path I've set for myself, and that was that, and that's what he did. As his minister of public order, Franco appointed General Martina the Nido. This man's reputation was based on his brutal repression of anarchists in Barcelona in the 20s. Anido's appointment marked Franco's determination, above all, to strictly suppress any working-class resistance. If anyone was caught with any association with working-class parties or trade unions, they were summarily dealt with. Francisco Poyatas López, a lawyer, had escaped assassination squads in Republican Madrid, but he found justice was no fairer in the nationalist zone. Entraban, por ejemplo, 20 individuos. Twenty people would go in and the trial would take less than a quarter of an hour. There wasn't even time for them to make statements, nothing at all. It was even worse than the executions without trial because on top of everything it was making a mockery of justice, giving an appearance of legality to something which was not legal at all. And also, as I learnt later on, Franco insisted that only one in five people could be acquitted. That was the highest proportion. The nationalist passion for the unity of Spain meant stamping on all aspirations for autonomy of the traditionally distinctive regions of Catalonia and the Basque Country. In the Basque Country, the physical devastation was matched with the attempt to destroy the spirit of Basque nationalism. The Basque language was prohibited. Even the road signs were painted out. 
in April 1938, as Franco's army was poised to invade Catalonia, he announced the abolition of the region's home rule. The decree proclaimed that Catalonia would now have the honour of being governed on an equal footing with the rest of Spain. Before the war was over, it became clear what that honour entailed. The so-called law of political responsibilities retrospectively made anyone who had been an active Republican for 18 months before the war liable to prosecution. It included anyone who resisted Franco during the war. More often than not, the sentence was death, even if it wasn't always carried out. By the spring of 1938, he was already rounding up thousands of Republican soldiers and sending them to concentration camps. And the war still had a year to run. <laughs> 